This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. Boys, it's been a long time since it's been an Us episode, what we call an Us episode. It's been well over a month since we've recorded one. Yeah. Wow. So, of course, the big burning question, you got to show us your new battle bot. I'm skeptical that anybody was wondering about that, but in case they were, <laughs> I did have it sitting next to me to show to the camera. This is uh, this is our, our current iteration of the BattleBot. It's it's um, you know, one of the things we discovered is that tungsten is one of the densest metals that exists, and you can actually buy pieces of tungsten. So, in the tips of this piece of plastic here, are as we do a shameless plug for our YouTube channel for this. <laughs> <laughs> are encased big pieces of uh, of tungsten. Really? So the the weight of that spinning object is uh, I don't know what you call it unsafe maybe or uh, fun wow. one one of the two <laughs> possibly both. But it, it could do some serious damage to another battle bot. Uh, to anything really. You should hear it. I'll maybe we can do. It. I'll, I'll I'll make a video. It's it's. <laughs> It's nuts. It sounds like a turbine or something when it's going at full speed. Wow. wow. Very cool. Uh, so I got a Spark amp for Christmas. You heard of a Spark amp? Nope. It's, there's a huge community online talking about this. It's an amp you buy for your guitar. It's, I don't know, $250 or something. So as far as amps go, it's very affordable. But it's an amazing digital device that links with your smartphone. And pretty much any song you want, you load it up. It'll play the song, the video of the song, and all the chords for it, and play the music through the amp. It's just a brilliant piece of of, of technology to to practice with, and it's so much fun. And cool. the sound of the amp, and, and you can also download all kinds of different, well, it's got all kinds of built-in pedal sounds automatically, but then there's a whole, I guess their, their business model is to sell you more, more pedals, so you can buy all these pedal sounds, whatever sound you want, any hmm. artist, any guitars, any song, you can buy that sound. So it's, it's very cool. Wow. Um, one show uh, that I, I, a little bit different than what we normally talk about, which are often a little more gruesome shows, but have you seen Somebody Feed Phil on Netflix? No. So we discovered this this weekend, you know, being cold in Ottawa and the pandemic, so we're inside. Anyway, so Phil Rosenthal is a former co-producer of Everybody Loves Raymond. He does this travel food show that is fabulous. Travels the world and really gets into the culture and, and, and hangs out with local people and how they cook and eat. Oh, we just loved it. Wow. It's a real good news, happy, pleasant, amazing uh, photography. So it's on Netflix. Hmm. Yeah. Um, quick update. The merch store is obviously wide open. We have lots of hoodies available and there's still some of the free socks available. Anything you want to update on the community? Community board? No, it's uh, it's it's pretty crazy over there in terms of the amount of content that's being generated, which makes me very happy that we switched to the new platform because it's all searchable and, and easy for people to find. Um, so, what are the, some of the new features that are up now that we've upgraded the platform? Like, there's you can rank or vote. Oh, the, the, the the new features were uh, they weren't well received by the community, so I don't know how much I'm going to say about them because uh -oh. they might go away. But you're you're able to vote on topics. Um, which was cool, but the way that Discourse has it set up is that everyone's got a limited number of votes. So we made it so that old posts would close so that people would get their votes back, but people weren't happy about posts closing. Right. So Angelica is going to rejig everything to um, make it closer to what everybody thinks it should be like. But anyway, it's, it's edging up on 2,000 users in the community now, which is pretty, it's a big pretty cool. Um, and there's still tons of really good, thoughtful discussion going on in there. So, I, I mean, if anybody in, in, enjoys listening to the podcast, I would encourage them to check out the the community because the the quality of the discussions there are, are really, really high. Yeah, I agree. We have a new segment in the podcast that we're going to try out called Talking Sense. So, for those on YouTube, you can see we've discovered these really cool, almost like playing cards that came out from the University of Chicago Financial Education Initiative. So this is basically cards with interesting questions just to prompt discussions around financial education. 
and uh, they're available for $20 US directly from, from the education initiative. Order them, they ship within a week or so. And they're not right or wrong type questions, they're just questions to stimulate your thinking. So we're gonna ask each other, or just pick a couple cards each episode and see how it goes. Today's were a little tough, but. I think uh, conceptually, <laughs> I think it's a really cool idea. It, it would it would maybe feel tacky if we picked these cards up from the dollar store, but because they've come from the University yeah. of Chicago, um, I think it's I think it's pretty cool. And as an initiative, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, their their yeah. suggestion is that you kind of have these conversations around the dinner table sort of thing yeah. with uh, with kids they recommend ages seven and up. Um, so we th- we thought it would be kind of neat for us to do the same thing. But geez, the questions were <laughs> the questions were harder than I was expecting. But we, not we, hard, like analytically hard. It's not that kind of question. It's like, what? How do you even think about this? I mean, you'll hear it at the end of the episode. Yeah, but we decided not to script it ahead of time because we didn't want some sort of perfect polished answer because it's not the point of it, right? It's to get you to think about these questions. So our, our hope is that we'll add this to the episode discussion. We'll put the question in there yeah. so people that are in the online community can discuss how they would answer the question. That's kind of our, our idea is to get that conversation going. And then, you know, if, if people don't want to go buy the cards, they can take the we- weekly question from the episode and take it home to the dinner table and talk about it with their family. And I don't know, hopefully it starts some good discussion around money. Exactly. And with that, we hope you enjoy episode 134, the first Us episode of 2021. Thanks for listening. So we'll kick off episode 134 with a quick, very quick book review. So a very good friend of mine posted on Twitter at the end of last year, his favorite nonfiction book of 2020 was a book called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. So I dug into it I'm about two thirds of the way through it over Christmas and it's so interesting. So it's written by David Epstein and the basic premise that the author makes is that specializing early on in life is unwarranted, be it in school or other activities. And he argues that it's even more true in a tech driven world where figuring out how to solve problems matters more than a specific set of tools. And it kind of flies in the face of, you know, the old, you need 10,000 hours or something to become a master of your domain. This basically blows that up. However, he does, uh, qualify that by saying that if you're interested in an endeavor that there is immediate feedback and he gives examples like guitar, golf, tennis, like there's no nuance in how well you do. Like if you're not good at guitar, uh, as I can tell you is the way I play, it shows up pretty quickly. Same with golf or tennis. So you need specialization and to get those shots like Tiger Woods famously shot back in you know, 2000 or 2008, you need years and years and years of practice. But he says, if your world is quote, wicked, where rules and scorekeeping is unclear and the feedback is not immediate, then a broader experience set may be of greater value to you. And uh, the author actually researched many successful people and found that generalists are, he, as he quotes, primed to excel. And people who fail often, quit often, and try different things often end up with very fulfilling and rewarding careers and end up with a, a certain level of resilience to help them through life. So really enjoying the book, highly recommend it. That'll make sense. Yeah, I've, I found it interesting because it is such a different perspective from the 10,000 hours argument, right? So, I mean, I think of, you know, when we raised our kids, you know, if, if you didn't like, you know, Anna didn't like uh, dance, she went on to piano right? And, and it's okay to kind of bounce around and try different things and see what you like, as opposed to being forced to stick with something and that giving up on it is quitting. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. I remember that, that was one of the things that attracted me to um, engineering was that it's, it's not so much about um, be, having one specific skill set. It's more about solving problems but it's also something where the answers in engineering aren't exactly nuanced. I mean, there's immediate feedback, whether you're right or wrong. True. Uh, not always. 
I think problems can be more complex than that. If, if, if it's physics specifically, that's true. I think engineering is a little more nuanced. Interesting. On to the news of the week. I go in again quickly because we have lots of material. So I had a lot of people on Twitter reach out to me about this article that was in Bloomberg on January 13th entitled, Index Fund Trillions Are Distorting Prices in the S&P 500. So the article argued that large fund flows into the S&P 500 index are disproportionately raising prices of large cap stocks mainly in the US. And the article talks about researchers from Michigan State, along with London School of Economics and the University of California at Irvine, analyzed data from 2000 to 2019 and found that, quote, noise traders were pushing up the prices of the big companies as they enter the S&P 500. Thus, they end up with a larger weight in the index and distorted prices mean fund flows into valuate indexes exacerbate, exacerbate that situation. And then they argue that this will pave the way for the outperformance of the smaller companies in the S&P 500 when the price gap normalizes. Any thoughts on that? Ah, it's kind of like the Michael Burry article that we talked about not that long ago where he didn't have the, the analysis like this to back it up, but he said basically the same thing. That he thinks that these prices are getting distorted and we can argue about that. Um, but the result, and this was kind of the conclusion that we had last time we talked about this, is that uh, you know if it if it does result in large cap growth being overpriced and small value being underpriced, then hey, <laughs> great. <laughs> Interesting to note the recent price uh, performance difference between like the U.S. small cap value index and the S and P five hundred index. These are just uh, snapshots in time. I'm not predicting anything, but the the IJS index, the small cap U.S. small cap value index, is up forty three percent for the past six months to today, which is, well, to Friday, January 22nd. So 43% for the past six months. The S&P 500, same time period, six months, up 19%. So you are seeing a big difference in recent recent returns. And the one-year returns are actually quite similar. Small cap value, one year, 15%. S&P 500, one year, 18%. It's crazy how close they are. Yeah. Uh, next piece of news, the TESS evaluation saw a tweet earlier this year that compared the evaluation of Tesla to the entire Canadian market. So get this, Tesla is now worth 800 billion or so US, which is roughly a trillion Canadian. The total value of all 1,572 companies on the TSX is 3.2 trillion Canadian. So can you imagine Tesla that produces half a million cars a year is worth a third of the entire TSX market. It's also interesting to note that Tesla is now worth $75 billion more than the entire S&P 500 energy sub-index, which is made up of 25 energy companies, you know, starting with Exxon, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and all the way down. Just think that's, it's incredible comparisons. Um, as you know, Tesla joined the S&P 500 index in December, and there's another tweet that came out that a lot of people tweeted at me over the holidays of a 39-year-old software engineer and Tesla inventor, investor who recently retired, has $12 million US of Tesla shares, made 900K in one day, and was, quote, not selling shares for the foreseeable future. And I think was going to use margin to fund his lifestyle. Isn't that what, I, I can't remember the, the list, but Robert Schiller has a sort of checklist for what constitutes a bubble. And I'm pretty sure stories like this are one of the, one of the things, like specifically stories about people becoming extremely wealthy in the bubble asset are one of the checklist items for whether or not a thing is a bubble. Not saying it is. Right. But. Uh, next little piece of quick news, psychedelic mushroom ETF is coming. So if you're into psychedelic mushrooms as an investment, there's a new ETF coming on the NEO exchange in Canada under the symbol PSYK from Horizons ETFs. Supposed to start trading this week. So just news flashes, perhaps. Is that, is that rational reminder appropriate news? I don't know. I'm just telling you. You never know what's going to come out in this marketplace. Maybe that's a sign of a bubble. I just It's amazing to me, these kind of products. You throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Well, that's, I mean, Horizons, that's part of their business. Like they're the first one to launch the marijuana ETF, the HMMJ, which um, 
didn't do so well. Okay, at least the next story, the quick fourth story does have some data in it. So cash is king in TFSAs. This was an online survey sponsored by BMO that was conducted by the Polar Strategic Insights of 1,500 Canadians in late November last year that found the average amount held in a TFSA increased increased 9% in 2020 to just under 31,000. And 53% of respondents said they contributed the amount they expected to in 2020. Who would have guessed, right? I guess decreased spending enabled you to save more. However, and this is what I thought was interesting, only 49% were aware that a TFSA can hold both cash and at least one other type of investment. However, cash is the primary investment making up 38% of respondents' TFSA balances on average. Hmm. I, go, I remember when they came out, right? The tax-free savings account, there's a lot of debate around whether having savings in the name would mislead people in terms of what could be held inside. And I think it probably does. I don't think it's a very good name because it, be, like, yeah, a, a lot of people don't realize that you can hold and should hold or not. That's not necessarily always true. In, in an optimal scenario, you would want to hold long-term investments in TFSA, not cash. But I don't know if... I don't know how common that knowledge is. Maybe it should be tax-free investment account. Anyways. But we also know from um, Adriana Robertson and from Josh, um, Josh Brown and Brian Portnoy, that people people tend to hold more cash than a rational model would predict. Right. It's just interesting they would hold it into the account that, for many people, is the last account they'll ever touch. But a lot of people don't have enough investments True. to max out their RSPs and TFSAs. True. Agree. So on to our portfolio topic this week, something you've spent a lot of time digging into. Spent a lot of time on it a while ago and then re rediscovered my notes. <laughs> and, and, they, and they became relevant again. We, we've, actually, we've covered the topic once before on the podcast, but um, th there was a bunch of new research, I guess, that I, I, I put together for a, a question that, Somebody asked me. Uh, anyway, I thought it was worthwhile to revisit it because there's enough enough new content, and because 2020 was one of the biggest IPO years since 2000 in terms of the number of IPOs yep. and the the uh, aggregate IPO proceeds. So big big IPO year last year, and obviously we we all heard about a lot of the big ones. Um. Now that, that phenomenon of IPOs happening in waves, that's not a new thing. Um, the 99, 2000, that was a, a wave that people probably remember. Um, but as early as 1975, that's the first paper that I could find documenting this. Uh, the, the idea that IPOs happen in waves called hot, hot markets have been documented. That was a 1975 paper by Ibbotson and Joff in the Journal of Finance called Hot Issue Markets. Um, so in the 1960s, there was a big IPO wave with electronics-related companies. And in uh, in a random walk down Wall Street, um, Bert Malkiel refers to that as the Tronics boom. I don't know if that's what everybody called it, but I think it's a pretty good name. Um, and then 1983, there was another big, big explosion of IPOs, and that was microelectronics and biotechnology. And then we had the dot-com that I mentioned in the late 1990s. Um, now, when it comes to IPOs, and the same thing happened last year, I mean, it, it probably always happens the same way. I don't know, you can you can speak to the historical context more than I can, Cameron, but people talk so much about the first day returns of the IPO. Yes. And when it comes to fear of missing out and people wanting to, to, to get in on the IPO, action i think that they're often thinking about those first day returns but the, the the single most important takeaway on this on this topic of investing in ipos is that you don't i mean you probably won't be able to partake in that first day return because when the media reports on that number they're typically reporting on the difference between the ipo offer price and the, maybe the first trade or maybe the closing price on the first day of trading um, but that difference that's called the IPO pop colloquially, colloquially um, that, that difference is not something that most investors can access because most investors don't get in on the IPO allocation. That's right. 
IPO allocations go to institutional investors for the most part. And for any allocation that does go to retail investors, it goes to wealthy is not even the right term. Um, Active. Yeah. Active and wealthy, some combination of the two. High, high value, like high value brokerage clients. Yeah. So if you're through through some combination of brokerage services and other services that the firm provides, like maybe you maybe you took your company public through this firm or whatever, uh, but if you've generated a large amount of revenue for the financial institution that that's part of the underwriting uh, of the IPO, you're more likely to get um, an allocation. Most other people, especially for these hot IPOs, the ones that are oversubscribed, the average person's probably not going to be able to get um, any. And if they can, it's not going to be as much as yeah. they want to get. Highly, highly unlikely to get it. Now, those first day returns, where I'm importantly saying that you can't access them, but the reason they're so exciting is because they're so big. And they are. <laughs> like the, the, the difference between the IPO offer price... Um, and the closing price on the first day of trading, so what the market actually values the shares at relative to the um, price that they um, sold, sold in the IPO at, uh, is is a huge jump. So uh, J- Jay Ritter has the data on this. He's uh, uh, he's a professor. He's actually coming on the podcast uh, in, in the next few months. Um, but he's got all of this data on his website available for for free, kind of like Ken, Ken French data sort of idea, but for IPOs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he shows for 2020, the average first day pop was almost 50%. That is wild. And it's, it's interesting when you look back historically, um, there's been the IPO waves where a lot of IPOs happen at once, but those pops tend to be bigger during the, those waves. So you look back at how big the pops were in 2020, uh, the last time they were that big, if I remember correctly, was in 99, 2000, wow. which is also kind of scary to, to think about. Wow. And, that, and that's one of the important things about that is that it's, it's money left on the table for the company. Yeah. Because the company, like the actual, what they get for selling their equity is the IPO offer price. So if a company has a 50% pop on yep. the first day, they left that much on the table because they don't get that money. Right. Less underwriting the institutions fees. Institutions have bought there. Right, right. Um, and we look back from 1980 through 2020, the first day pop has been about 20%. So 50% in 2020, 20% from 1980 through 2020. So you can see the pop, the, the average first day pop in 2020 was huge, even compared to history. But regardless, over the full period, 20%, if you, if you got in on all the IPO allocations mm-hmm. and you're getting hit with 20%, first day returns that's that's pretty awesome but you but you can't <laughs> or you, you probably can't um get access to it uh fidelity actually has on their website like i mentioned the high value brokerage clients they actually publish on their website um their process so they say each customer who wants to participate in an ipo offering is evaluated and ranked based on his or her assets and the revenue they generate for the brokerage firm Typically, customers with significant long-term relationships with their brokerage firm will receive higher priority than those with smaller or new relationships. Right? That's and then there's a paper the that works. actually... Yeah, right. right. Um, there's a paper, an academic paper in the Journal of Finance that actually looked at this issue uh, from an academic perspective. So they had a broader d- data set than obviously just Fidelity's statement, but the paper was called um, Quid Pro Quo, What Factors Influence IPO Allocations to Investors? And they looked at 220 IPOs from January 2010 to May 2015, and they were trying to find what are the determinants of IPO allocations. So what what characteristics of the investor determine who's going to get uh, hot IPO allocations specifically? And they found, like what Fidelity says, they found strong support for brokerage revenues associated with a client uh, being a significant determinant. And they found that that effect is stronger in hotter IPOs. So if an IPO is more oversubscribed, more people want to access it, um, the the higher value clients getting access, that that effect is stronger. Which, if you think about the the other side of that, if an IPO is not hot, if nobody wants it, that one's going to be easier to get if you're not a high value client. <laughs> But it's the hot, the hot ones that everybody wants that tend to have the big first day pops. 
It's wild. So there's a bit of uh, a- adverse selection there where the, the, the ones with the biggest expected pops, the hottest IPOs are harder to access unless you're a high value brokerage client. Now, what's that? I'm still thinking about that 50% pop in 2020 and what's the cause behind it. And I mean, you would think the underwriters would have seen the demand coming and may have been able to better price it. Or do you think in the end, just to have that kind of excitement is good for all the IPOs in general? There's there's a whole, and I just sort of tangent, tangentially noticed this as I was doing this research. Uh, I didn't dig into it though. But there's a whole body of research on why institutions allow for these underpricings. Because everybody knows about it. It's not a secret. Yeah. Um, actually, we, I, I do touch on it a little bit uh, in in these notes, so we'll, we we'll, we can come back sure. to it. But I'll, I'll mention it briefly now, actually, just because you brought it up. Um, well, one of the papers mentions that um, retail investors may have a preference for skewness. Yeah, they have may have a preference for lottery like outcomes, so they're getting bad outcomes most of the time with a small chance of getting a really good outcome, and institutions don't. So this paper empirically uh, tested if there's a skewness preference. So they found institutions don't have that. Retail investors do. So on the first day of trading, when the hands change, uh, the the hands the shares change hands from yep. institutions to retail investors, the skewness preference that retail investors have results in a big price pop. And institutions don't tend to take that skewness preference into account because they don't have it when they're valuing the shares. Right. So who knows if that is the answer, but it, it's an interesting observation. I think what you're basically saying is a lot of individual investors may not know the metrics of the company, like the valuation metrics, but they're willing to take a shot that this company is going to change whatever space it's in. So, I mean, it's it's even, it's more mathematical than that even. It's just, if, if, if they have a preference for skewness, they'll pay more for it than somebody with standard risk preferences right. would pay for the same share. Like the valuation in their eyes, because they don't have standard um, r- risk aversion preferences, because they've got the skewness preference, their their valuation is going to be different than somebody who does have the more uh, normal, I guess, right. um, approach. But we've heard people say they want to buy X company because it is going to change, pick a company in the past year, it doesn't matter which one, but they don't have any idea what the valuation metrics are around the company. Yeah, it, it could be a similar effect. I mean, it's, it it could relate also to what what we learned with Adriana Robertson that that a lot of what academic theory suggests drive people's decisions is very different from what people actually say. Yes, <laughs> is driving their yep. is driving their decision. It could be a similar thing. Like the it could show up in the data as a preference for skewness, but in reality, it's just people, um, you know, yoloing. Yep. because they think the company is going to do going to do well. Um. Okay, so if we if we come back to J J Ritter uh, data, um, and, and this is now we're going to start differentiating here for the rest of the conversation. We're going to focus on IPO returns, excluding the first day pop, because like we've just been describing, you can't actually access that. So, from our perspective, looking at this, it doesn't make a whole. I mean, you know, how, how many. IPO allocations have we seen people get like not a lot, practically speaking. Um, but on on the first day of trading, though, that's when people tend to get yep. the shares. I mean, if if it's like a junior mining company on the TSXV, then maybe you can probably get the <laughs> first day allocation. But for you know Airbnb or whatever, it's very very unlikely. Unless, unless like we've been saying, you're a large client of one of the firms that's part of the underwriting syndicate for that, for that IPO. Um, okay, so coming back to Jay Ritter data, from 1990, 1980 through 2018, the average three-year buy and, hold, buy and hold return for IPOs measured from the closing price on the first day of trading, um, which is the relevant price to those of us who cannot access the IPO price, um, trail the market by... 17.5% in total. And they trail a style adjusted benchmark by 6.6% in total. So that's all IPOs from 19, 1980 through 2018. For three years. Yep. Th- three year buy and hold returns, yeah, for that for that time period. 
So pretty bad. Uh, and there's more data we'll talk about in a sec related to the same thing. Now tech is the one that gets all the today. Anyway, I mean, I'll, I guess all those, all the ones we talked about historically going back to 1960, they're all tech related, uh, which is actually kind of interesting in itself. Um, so for, for the tech industry, industry specifically from 1980 through 2018, but excluding 99, 2000, cause like uh, that must make the data look funny or something. Uh, J Ritter data shows that IPOs beat their style adjusted benchmark by a cumulative, cumulative 17.2%. So that's cumulative, not annualized, but trailed the market by 2.7%. Now this starts to touch on, and, and we're going to touch on it more, but it starts to edge up on one of the interesting characteristics of IPOs, which is that they tend to behave like small cap growth stocks Wow. Um, that, that have weak profitability and invest aggressively, which as we know from like an, I guess theoretically and empirically, those are the worst stocks. Yep. So we see them in this case, uh, with the J Ritter data, we see that they, they, um, beat their style adjusted benchmark, which is probably more like a small cap growth type benchmark. So they, they did a little bit better than that, but trailed the market, which is kind of what you'd expect if it were a hmm. small cap growth portfolio. So then if we look at uh, a, a, another data source, we've been talking about the J Ritter data, and now we're going to look at a paper titled The Long-Term Performance of IPOs Revisited. This is a 2017 paper. So in this case, they looked at 7,487 IPOs after the first day of trading from 1975 through 2014. And similar to what we just saw with J Ritter data, they find that IPO firms tend to underperform for the first two years even when we account for common risk factors. So that, that's actually a little bit different from what we just mentioned with Jay Ritter. Uh, they, they underperform even when we account for size, relative price, and momentum is what they looked at in this paper. Uh, now the underperformance, and this is another interesting point, uh, the underperformance relative to the, to the proper risk um, factor benchmark, the underperformance gradually declines with longer time periods. And after two years, this paper found that the under underperformance relative to a style appropriate benchmark becomes statistically insignificant. Interesting. So in, in that data series, the the IPOs, even when you account for the common risk factors, they did worse than that, but that only lasted for two years. Now, why is that? I don't I don't know if I have the answer there. Uh, Dimensional did a paper on this in 2019. And they again looked at a pretty big data series of 6,362 US IPOs from 1991 to 2018. And the approach that they took in this case was that they built a, a hypothetical cap weighted IPO portfolio. So they, they included IPOs issued over the preceding 12 month period and they rebalanced the portfolio monthly. They excluded first day returns like we've been talking about, you, you should. And they found that over the full period, the IPO portfolio trailed the market by about 2% while also being much more volatile. And they found in their, in their sample that the IPO returns were well explained by the factors in the, in the Fama French five factor model. So the previous one was using Carhartt four factor. And now they're, we're talking about Fama French five factor. Um, and in their data, this is where I got the idea that um, IPO firms on average behave like small cap growth stocks with weak profitability that invest Aggressively, the the fatal combination. <laughs> the worst of all worlds. Um, yeah, the worst, the worst of all all worlds. And the other interesting piece about that is that stocks within that category not only do they they perform poorly um, as an asset class, but they also have lottery like returns. Wow. And so we're going to touch more on this idea of lottery like returns because it becomes potentially important from a a, a pricing perspective. Uh, but it's just this idea that you have a small chance. It's like your the the um, story you told Cameron, where people might want to buy this thing because they think they think it could be the next whatever, so they're willing to they're willing to take the gamble. That's that is um, a plain English description of a preference preference for skewness. We basically know that excluding that first day pop, which makes that makes things look really good, but once it's excluded, the performance of IPOs is quite poor. For sure, for the first two or so years. I mean, one study found after two years, the underperformance becomes statistically insignificant. Um, but yeah, I mean, for, for some amount of time after a company goes public, there seems to be excess negative 
performance. And in any case, the firms are behaving like small cap growth. Um, slope, I think is what Dimensional calls it. Small growth, low low profitability, um, aggressive investment. Um, so that, that once that's excluded, IPO is not so good. So then the next question, we kind of touched on with the SKUNA's preference, but the next question is why? Why Why does that happen? Um, so that there's a paper, and this is where I got the SKUNA's idea. Um, the, there's a 2011 paper titled IPOs as Lotteries, SKUNA's Preference and First Day Returns. So in this case, the authors uh, explain, and this, this is really interesting, they explain that IPOs with high expected SKUNA's and they had a bunch of proxies for expected skewness, which they tested as predictors of actual skewness. It's kind of kind of crazy to think about, I guess. Um, so the the IPOs with the highest expected skewness experience larger, significantly larger first day pops. Um, so these lottery like stocks are the ones that have the biggest pops. That's really interesting. So the the business model has skewness. Is that what you're saying? Uh, there were a bunch of different skewness That's, metrics, not business model. It was probably industry related and, and things like that and market condition related. Um, yeah, I'd have to dig back into super the interesting. See what I'm just imagine it. It, it could be a, like a potential winner take all type company. That's, that's the idea behind the preference yeah. for skewness is that you're willing to overpay for that possibility, even though there's a very yeah. low chance of it actually coming, uh, coming to fruition the way that you expect it to. Fascinating. Uh, yeah. So then the, the other piece where this gets interesting when we're talking about the negative abnormal returns is that the IPOs with the highest expected skewness, so they get the first the, the biggest first day pop, yep. they also earn the most or more negative abnormal returns in the one to five years after the IPO. Negative abnormal returns. Correct. So more expected skewness leads to higher pop also leads to, and I don't know if they they don't follow in a chain, but higher skewness uh, also leads to more negative abnormal performance. Fascinating. Yes. Now, here's another one where it gets really interesting. Um, the the hi higher expected skewness is also associated with a higher fraction of small sized trades on the first day of trading. So the authors suggest that this is consistent with a greater shift in holdings from institutions who, like I mentioned earlier, they found empirically don't seem to prefer skewness to individuals who seem to be willing to pay a premium for skewness. So now we've got these bigger first day pops being related to higher expected skewness. So the more lottery like the payoff, the bigger the pop, but also the more negative the average returns. Um, and this seems to be related to a change of hands from institutions to retail investors. But you just think about the, you know, the, this, this phenomenon of meme stocks, um, like Tesla, although Tesla did an IPO last year, obviously. Um, but just this concept of the stocks that become so popular in, in the social media world, um, that fits so well with this narrative of people preferring skewness and being willing to pay a lot for it. Um, and I don't know, like maybe I'm just being his historically ignorant to think that there was no such thing as a meme stock in the past, but I don't know. Cameron, was there? <laughs> or is this a new thing? Well, it's nothing like today, right? It's, you think of the ones that have gone lately, DoorDash, Airbnb, Slack. It's wild. Yeah. And now stepping back and thinking about this rationally, for someone with standard risk preferences, um, the lottery like payoff is not what you want. I mean, just like buying lottery tickets is not a good financial decision. Like you're, you're going to lose money, except there's a tiny chance you won't. <laughs> I guess you're buying hope. What's hope worth to you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I find the, the effect of the, the, the changing of hands from institutions to retail investors and that being related to skewness, which is related to bigger first day pops, which is related to more negative returns. <laughs> I find that to just be absolutely um, fascinating. And you could, I think the paper is even making the argument that retail investors are driving this. They're driving the bigger pop 
because they have such a strong, strong skewness preference and they're therefore driving the, the significantly negative um, returns. Yeah, and you wonder if so, access to technology like Robinhood and other online trading platforms accelerates this too because it's so easy now to do it. it. It would be difficult to argue that that is not the case. And that's kind of, I guess, related to my question about meme stocks historically and if that was a thing. I mean, people still had ways to communicate. I don't know. And people have been day trading for a while. I think like that technology has existed for quite a long time. I think back to 99, 2000, everyone knew everyone. Market participants knew that there was a lot of hot stocks that were coming, but you had to get a brokerage account and it wasn't that obvious to set up an online account back then. Like you had to go to the bank, you had to get the signatures done. You had to go through a process. It wasn't all online back then. And keeping in mind that paper, uh, I don't know if I had, it was a 2011 paper. I, I don't, I didn't know when they're, what, what data set that they were looking at, but yeah, I don't know. It, it would be interesting to look at that skewness effect over time and in, in 2020 as well. It'd be fascinating to see that data series extended. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So just based on the skewness preference, uh, that's, that's seems like a pretty compelling reason to avoid hot IPOs. IPOs in general don't do well. Hotter ones do worse, arguably because retail investors are willing to overpay due to their preference for skewness, which doesn't make any sense, but <laughs> neither does buying lottery tickets. And we know there's a market for that too. But that's not even the worst part when we're talking about IPO waves anyway. Um, so a year like 2020, when there's a big wave of IPOs, what we just described doesn't answer the question of why that happens. So that's a different thing. You get the big IPO pops, you can argue that's a skewness preference, but why do we get these big waves of IPOs? Like I mentioned, 60s, 83, 99, 2020, big waves of IPOs, why does that happen? Uh, my favorite paper, I don't know if you should have favorite papers or not, but my favorite one on this topic was from um, Lubosh Pastor, who we obviously had on the podcast, and we didn't talk about this topic with him. And I, and I think it could almost be like a, a whole separate episode, having him back on again to talk about his research on technological revolutions and IPO waves. Anyway, so he's got a 2005 paper titled Rational IPO Waves. And similar to what we've talked about with Pastor's past research, he takes, takes what seems like it should be an obvious irrational explanation. So IPOs happen. I mean, the, the irrational narrative is that IPOs happen uh, because of mispricing. So companies go public because they realize it's basically an arbitrage opportunity where they can sell their equity for more than it's worth. But Pastor in this paper gives the rational case for why IPOs could happen in waves. So they create a model and then they test the model to see how well it uh, matches up with what's happened historically. And they find that the model's predictions are very close in line with what we've seen in the past. So in their model, uh, private private firms are attracted to capital markets when market conditions are favorable, which makes sense, uh, in, in the sense that expected market returns are low. So expected returns are low, meaning prices are high. That attracts firms to the market, which sounds pretty similar to the mispricing story, except we're talking about low expected returns instead of um, an arbitrage opportunity. Also, when expected aggregate profitability is high. So again, if, if the uh, we're, we're in a good place in the business cycle. Things are good. Everyone's optimistic. Uh, that means expected profits are high, which means prices are going to be higher. Although that's not a, an expected return component. That's a cash flow ex expectations component. Uh, and then the last one is the uh, t taking those together. Private firms will wait for an improvement in market conditions before going public. So if market conditions are not good, private firms aren't going to go public. And then as market conditions improve, private firms will go public. Yep. So once they've improved sufficiently, a wave of private companies will exercise their option to go public. And so that's why you get these um, IPO waves. Now, from the perspective of investing in IPOs, I think that a couple of the conditions in their model are, are particularly important. So the, 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 the one that we just mentioned with expected returns, if expected returns are low, dumping a bunch of money into a company that went public because expected returns were low probably doesn't lead to high expected returns, <laughs> which should be somewhat obvious. Um, 
and they observe this to be true, where where after IPO waves, there, there tend to be high market returns preceding IPO waves and low market returns um, following IPO waves, which makes sense. Um, and then the other one, and we talked about this in our technological revolutions discussions, is that IPO waves based on high prior uncertainty about the post IPO average profitability in excess of market profitability for the companies going public should result in high prices for the IPOs because the relationship uh, between profitability and price is convex. Yep. So I'm not going to go into detail because we dug yep. into this pretty deep yep. in a previous episode, but it's the whole Jensen's inequality thing where uncertainty about profitability increases price all else equal. Yep. Now, technically there's no impact on expected returns in that case because it's not affecting the discount rate um, mechanism on on price. But as uncertainty decreases, um, based again on Jensen's inequality, prices should fall, all else equal. So Pastor in the paper specifically references technological revolutions and says that that can be w- one of the things that plays into um, a, an IPO wave. And if you think about the prior uncertainty from the perspective of the companies going public, it makes a ton of sense for them to do so. And again, this is not a, it's not a mispricing condition, but if there's a ton of uncertainty about the profitability, the, the expected profitability of a, companies in a certain type of industry, um, and that makes their prices high rationally because they could do really well. It makes sense for them to go public, which is great. But once they go public and the market learns about their actual profitability, good or bad, um, prices should decline. All else equal. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, again, from the perspective of investing in IPOs, especially around IPO waves, I don't think it bodes very well for... I can't use expected returns in that case because it's not an expected returns mechanism, but um, doesn't bode well for for realized returns, um, I guess. And there's an expected return piece in there where market conditions have to be favorable with high prices, which again, relating to 2020, um, we absolutely had. Now, I do want to make it clear that I'm not saying IPOs are bad. We're not saying IPOs are bad. They're they are important to the economy. Now we can get a whole get into a whole debate about. Uh, whether the IPO path or the direct listing or the SPAC is better, but but whatever. Raising capital is an important part of a capitalist economy. Um, So it's not bad from that perspective. But from the perspective of investors accessing the the secondary market, um, I mean, the, the, the empirically IPOs are brutal. And I think the, the, the theory around the skewness preference and then you take the prior uncertainty piece and the uh, low expected returns piece. You mash all that together, and I mean, the, the bigger the IPO pops are, and the more IPOs that are happening in the market, the the, the worse the prospects for investing in IPOs seem to get. But a year like last year, it, that that was the thing to do because there were so many yep. hot, hot IPOs. It's absolutely fascinating. On to our planning topic. Let's do it. So we kind of have a theme going of late where we're looking at more the non-financial type things in planning. And this week is no different. We're going to talk about well-being, which I think is such an interesting topic for us to get into. And, And you've done some fabulous research on this. But it all stems from You know, financial advice typically focuses just on portfolio management, number crunching, quantitative financial planning, all the things that we normally cover in this podcast. But there's a whole concept of behavioral coaching that while it does get some acknowledgement, it it is becoming more and more important role for anyone either advising clients on their financial uh, issues or if you're advising yourself, you're self-managing your household finances. And when you think about finance, it's linked, it's directly tied to so many aspects of our lives. You know, so many people, go ahead. 
I think that the behavioral the behavioral coaching piece. I, I think this extends beyond that. I think when people think about behavior co- be, behavioral coaching as one of the things that a financial advisor or someone managing the household finances does, they're talking about you know staying invested and sticking with your asset allocation and sticking to your savings plan and all that kind of stuff. But I, I think that what we're going to talk about here is is quite a bit bigger than that, where it's instead of just looking at financial well-being and how do we make sure that the right behaviors are taking place to achieve that, this is more about what what are the what are the other decisions that people should be thinking about that are related to finances, but not related directly to financial well-being. And so it's like it's it's stepping further away from finance in a way relative to behavioral coaching, which is like I've said, how do you stay invested in your portfolio and looking at what, what are the, what, what are the non-financial impacts of financial decisions and what are the financial impacts of non-financial decisions and how do you make all those decisions together within a, a framework that maximizes overall well-being as opposed to just financial. Because financial well-being is not simply a number. It's more about having enough. It's not because most people typically want more all the time, right? We're wired to want more. But that does not necessarily lead to a higher level of well-being. And, yeah. and this goes back to things we talked to many times with Brian Portnoy. Um, you know, the whole notion of funded contentment. It's not a number. It's a mindset. It's a frame of mind financial well-being is often just about getting more this is more than that yeah it's it's that delineating financial well-being which like you said can be just about getting more like you, you're financially better off the more that you have but separating that from well-being broadly speaking which is about having enough so financial well-being the more you have the better from a strictly financial perspective but well-being is about having enough yeah. money to fund a meaningful life. Yep. It's what Brian calls um, funded contentment. Now, we, we start talking about well-being. Uh, we can still use words like capital, which I think are, are important. And Brian Portnoy, actually, the, the way that he defines capital for this purpose is anything that you can spend in order to achieve something that you want. So financial capital is what we give so much attention to, and it is important, and it's intertwined with all the different types of capital. But we also have human capital to allocate, social capital, so relationships and and your network, and temporal capital, which is just your time and how you allocate your time. Um, Now, what we're realizing, and we're going through a process to educate ourselves on this, but what we're realizing is that to give really good financial advice or alternatively to make really good financial decisions. You can't just look at one type of capital in isolation. Financial capital and human capital, we we have historically given attention to, but you start getting into the other types of capital and it, it can materially change. It can materially change the advice that you would give or the decisions that you would make, which is why we think it's important to start talking about it. Um, but you, to, just to use one example with philanthropy, um, and, and how the different types of capital are related to each other, you can give financial capital, you can donate money to, uh, charitable causes. Yep. You can allocate your human capital by donating your expertise. You can allocate social capital by speaking with your network about the cause that's, that's important to you, or you can allocate temporal capital by volunteering your time. Now, all, all of those things are related to each other because if you donate your time, you might have less financial capital. Yep. Um, and if you ask your network to donate to a cause that's important to you every day, you're, you're going to, uh, I guess, decrease your social capital. Um, anyway, so all of these decisions are re- recursive. It's a, it's a sort of closed, closed system, but advising on financial capital without considering the other types of capital, I think what we're realizing is, I mean, when you start getting into it and the the data behind what 
actually makes people live meaningful lives and what makes people feel good about themselves. You, you can almost start to argue that it's irresponsible to give financial advice without taking consideration of all the other things. Well, that's exactly the argument that Mayor Statman, who's the finance prof at Santa Clara University, makes in that article that we've been sharing back and forth, that advisors should be well-being advisors and enhancing their clients' well-being in all of these domains. And the reason that this is sensible for anyone managing overseeing households' finances is that all decisions are, in some way, capital allocation decisions. That's the argument he's making. And that the financial capital allocation decisions underpins most other capital allocation decisions because so many decisions have a financial component to them. So whether you're, as a financial advisor, giving advice or self-managing your things, you should be considering these various aspects of your well-being when managing your finances. 55% of people surveyed ranked money as the most important source of stress, followed by, I think, quite a distance behind stress over work, health, family, and social life. So that was a BlackRock survey, a recent BlackRock survey. Yeah, and that drew on, I think, four countries of data. So Mayor Statman in the paper that you mentioned, he he draws on that survey data and then also on a whole bunch of different uh, academic studies to, to explain why considering all these different facets is so, is so important. Um, but I love the way that he framed the... What do we, what what do we get from capital, and how we allocate our capital? And Statman gives three main benefits. Yeah, and he actually uses money in the paper, but I th- I think you can easily apply it to capital more generally speaking. Yeah. Um. So he says that you get util- utilitarian benefits, which is that that's the basics. And actually, Brian, I I think I had some notes on, on this from uh from Brian Portnoy too. Um, Brian says that f- financial well-being in, in, in his definition has four components, getting by, which is utilitarian benefits, yep. feeling safe, achieving goals, and then funding contentment right. is the sort of pinnacle of financial well-being. So that was Brian Portnoy, but back to, back to uh, Mayor Statman. So we've got utilitarian benefits, expressive benefits, so that's how you convey your values and tastes and social status using money. Now, people that listen to this podcast um, might sort of turn their nose up and say, well, I don't, I don't need those things. But when we start getting into the data, the, the academic literature on why those things are important, it may potentially change the way people think about it. And he gave some good We're examples. Gonna... So a couple of examples of expressive benefits. You know, buying a luxury, a luxury watch can ex- express prestige. Reservations at a fancy restaurant can express social status. But And again, we're going to touch on the literature about why yeah. those things can be more important than you would maybe expect. Uh, and then the third one that Statman touches on is emotional benefits. So that's how uh, the, the things that capital affords us makes us feel. So again, with the luxury watch, that can make you feel proud. Um, you can feel special having a nice... Meal, paying an insurance policy premium can make you feel safe. Lottery tickets or uh, or IPO stocks <laughs> can can give us hope. But it's interesting, like that luxury watch one. I mean, I often would think that was a signaling for many people. I hadn't thought about the the, the pride part of it. It could be different needs that are being fulfilled. Yeah. Now, uh, w- one of the things from this paper that. Reflecting on it, it seems like, how, of course, I should have known this, but I, I'd never really thought about it, I guess. So this was new for me, but the, the, the distinction between happiness and well-being. And they're often used interchangeably, but there was actually a paper by Kahneman and Deaton yeah. where they specifically explained how they're not the same thing. Um, happiness is like an emotion that you feel in a short, intense burst. And well, uh, well-being is something that requires reflection. Uh, so this was in in a the Kahneman Deaton paper was uh, high income improves evaluation of life, but not emotional well-being. It was a 2010 paper, and then this other piece was another new thing for me, which was the 
the Cantrell ladder. Had you heard about this camera? I had not. Yeah, so this is a whole new domain for us to explore. Um, so the Cantrell ladder is a question that asks, please imagine a ladder with steps numbered from zero at the bottom to 10 at the top. The top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you and the bottom ladder represents the worst possible life for you. On which step of the ladder would you say you personally stand at this time? Yep. I think it's, I mean, it's a pretty cool question to, to think about. Um, and then it gets into that, the, the stat that we've all heard, um, or I'm sure many of us have heard, which is that people with incomes below, you know, insert number, but in this study it's $75,000, um, are less happy and they do report less happiness yesterday, less enjoyment, less frequent smiling and less laughter. So that's people with incomes below $75,000. They're less happy. Uh, they also report more worries and greater sadness. So the, what you can draw from that is, okay, well, it's diminishing returns if my income goes up above 75000 Yeah. But yeah, and it's not. It's not. People whose annual incomes exceed 75000 by a wide margin don't report greater happiness than people whose annual incomes only exceed 75000 by a narrow margin. So it's clearly diminishing returns to happiness with increasing income. To, to happiness. And this is the, that's the one that everyone kind of, we've all heard that. So there are diminishing returns to happiness, but this is why that delineation between happiness and well-being becomes important. Um, because so if from the same study, um, the people whose annual income exceed a hundred thousand dollars report substantially higher well-being, well-being now, not happiness. So the, the evaluation of where you stand on the Cantrell ladder uh, then people whose annual income is 75000 and people whose annual income is $150,000 report substantially higher well-being than people whose annual income is $100,000. Right. So we see that diminishing returns concept disappear when we switch the framing from happiness, which is a fleeting emotion, to well-being, which is more of a, a reflective evaluation of how, how good is your life. So well-being reflects all possible benefits of income and wealth including, as you said earlier, the utilitarian benefits of the goods and services you're able to buy, as well as the expressive benefits of social status and the emotional benefits of pride. Yeah, so fascinating. Uh, so there's another paper by Deaton, 2018 paper uh, titled, What Does Self-Reports of Well-Being Say About Life Cycle Theory and Policy? So he found that on average, people in different countries place themselves on different steps of the Cantrell Ladder. Uh, it was a four on average in African countries and between seven and eight for the rich countries of Europe and the English speaking world. Women place themselves somewhat higher on the ladder than men, except in Africa. And people in rich countries tend to fall down the ladder during the transition from youth to midlife and then ascend it again as they grow older. That one I had, I had heard that one. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, and there's a bunch of other crazy statistics that you dug up. So get this one. Well, it seems unfortunate. Social comparison does play a huge role in well-being. So a paper you discovered called Neighbors and Negatives, Relative Earnings and Well-Being, found that an increase in neighbor's income reduces a person's well-being as much as an equal reduction in their own income, if that doesn't blow your mind. But an increase in the neighbor's income does not affect the well-being of people who do not socialize with their neighbors. So if you hang out with your neighbors and they get a pay increase and you don't, that affects your well-being. It's just. It affects your well-being as much as if you had your own Correct. pay decrease by the same amount. Yeah. And I, I didn't dig these up, by the way. These, well, I, I did sort of, but it's it's all from the Mayor Statman. He had a really, really long paper in uh, one of the journals I subscribed to. I can't remember which one. Um, but yeah, he, he had all of these papers cited to make to make his case. Another one, 2012 paper entitled Inequality at Work, the Effect of Peer Salaries on Job Satisfaction to study a group of university employees who were told about a new website that listed the salary of all university employees. The employees were then, then surveyed about their current job satisfaction and job search intentions. So employees with salaries below the median for their pay unit and occupation reported lower satisfaction with their jobs and pay and a significant increase in the likelihood of looking for a new job. 
just wild. Yeah, it is wild. So this, this idea of social comparison and status symbols starts to become, uh, I, again, my comment earlier about people listening to this saying, well, you know, well, that's, that's not rational to think that. I mean, I guess you, you could, there, there are ways to uh, think your way out of it. Like practicing stoicism maybe would be one one example, but the reality is uh, the, the reality is that we we have a natural incl- inclination to do these things, and it and it really does affect our uh, our well being. There was another one um, that, or, or just an, another point here is on elite education, which when we when you talk about the different benefits you can get from allocating capital, uh, elite education gives utilitarian benefits. Um, and there's a paper that Statman cites showing that the IRR on elite colleges is uh, is higher, but then it also delivers expressive and emotional benefits, like saying you went to went to Harvard or or whatever. Um, so again, just touching on the and and thinking about it practically, like these are real decisions that a family might make about where to go to. Uh, school or where to send the kids to school or where the kids should apply to school. And that's a financial decision in a way or in in an important way. I mean, I remember I looked at going to um, Princeton when I was choosing where to go and play basketball and the cost was prohibitive (laughs) (laughs) and Ivy leagues don't do uh, scholarships. They only do financial aid anyway. um, But I have often thought for, for no rational reason. And this is a completely, I even feel kind of embarrassed to say it, but I've often thought that it, it would have been, it would be cool to, you know, have, have a degree from Princeton instead of Northeastern. There's nothing wrong with Northeastern. <laughs> it's, it's a very good school. It's just be an um, AB test you could have done. Yeah. If I could go back. Uh, and then, so what, one of the other big things that, that plays into all of this is that humans are, are bad. And this is again, empirically true bad at effective forecasting. Um, we're, we're really bad at predicting yeah. what will make us happy in the future. Yes. And this is one of the fundamental problems with goal setting, which again, when we think back to uh, the Bri- Brian Portnoy's framework, uh, w- one of the components is achieving goals, but that's not the pinnacle. Funded contentment is is what you're really trying to achieve. And that's that difference between uh, between more achieving goals, you always need more and enough knowing when enough is enough. And that relates to effective forecasting because we don't really know. We might set a goal, an an ambitious financial goal, thinking that when we get there, we're going to be happy, but the data show that that doesn't tend to be the case. And what stems from that is that you should be doing things that make you happy now, not things that make you happy later. Or increase your well-being now. Got to be careful with my language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another aspect of well-being has to do with community and family. And finances, believe it or not, are linked to that. So the ability to spend more time with family and friends usually comes or often comes with having you know, a larger balance sheet. And then you have to start to consider the trade-off between... Um, time and the value of time. So do you want to work harder now to have more free time later? Or is it more important for you to take time now at the expense of a bigger balance sheet later and which will be better for your well-being? And these are financial decisions. Like we, we have these conversations with people all the time. Just, I don't know if we've been we're hoping to improve at, at accounting for all of these different aspects, but it's very easy to have a conversation about how much someone can save or how much they should save to reach a retirement goal. But that doesn't take into account whether that goal should be the goal. Right. And that's the piece where I think, I think that we have some work to do. And I think people in general, whether they're getting financial advice or making their own financial decisions, those are the components that need they need a lot more yeah, um, because setting that attention. plan in motion now may be terrible for your current well-being. Exactly, exactly. And then my comment earlier about it being the the more you go down this rabbit hole, 
you, you can make the argument that it's irresponsible to coach somebody on financial decisions without taking all of these other aspects into account yep. to sit down and do a financial plan and say, okay, you can, you, you want to retire yep. at 55. Okay. Well, here's yep. what you have to do. So when you think about what we were just talking about with, with savings and what's, what's the optimal saving amount, what are you saving for? You're saving to stop working. And then I think that, that, that question of, is that the right goal again, becomes important when you start looking at what the literature says about the relationship between work and well being. And you think about work and I know you can debate whether people like their jobs or not. And I, I know some people don't. Um, but the w- work, when you think again, back to those benefits of, uh, of allocating the different types of capital work provides utilitarian benefits through the earnings that we're all familiar with and spend most of our time talking about in related in relation to human capital. Uh, but work also provides or, or can provide expressive and emotional benefits. Um, people have, express their identity through their work and take pride in doing their job. Uh, work often contributes to membership in a, in a community. Losing a job takes away the income piece, uh, obviously, but it can also take away identity, pride, accomplishments, and membership in the, in the community. And purpose. Yeah. Yeah. There's a 2011 paper that looked at the impact of unemployment, uh, is, is a scarring or scaring the psychological impact of past unemployment and future unemployment risk. Uh, it's a 2011 paper. They found that unemployment remains a scar on well-being long after regaining employment. Now, you can argue that's different because that's not talking about retirement. It's talking about probably an unplanned job loss, but it does show that relationship um, in the data between work and well-being. Um, now that we, we've we've touched a little bit of, on temporal capital, time, and the importance of community and family and things like that. So again, we think about work, and there's this this recursive interaction where all aspects of well-being are affected. So work is fulfilling and provides utilitarian benefits, like we just mentioned. But working long hours can reduce time with family and friends. And stressful work can decrease the quality of time spent with family and friends. And <laughs> stress with family can make work more difficult. Um, all, all, of those, all of those things can be related back to different financial decisions that people might make over time. Um, whether it's financial capital or temporal capital allocation decisions. And you, you step back and think about all of this in the context of retirement planning which again, the, the quantitative and, you know, t- tax aspects of that we, we beat to death and spend so much time on, but things like creating a vision for retirement are arguably as important as all of the other financial stuff like financial security, which is critically important to a successful retirement, but financial security is only one of the many elements required to maintain a high level of well-being throughout retirement. It makes you realize why retirement is so hard. So many of those other benefits, there's a chance that they just disappear. Yeah. And there are like Larry, Larry Swedro's book, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement, I think it's called. In that book, he has a bunch of thought exercises that he got from different experts in the fields of, uh, of psychology um, that people can do to prepare for all of those other aspects of retirement. But again, the, the recursiveness in this overall model comes back into play um, because the, the, the financial aspects will facilitate the non-financial aspects. Yep. But the non-financial aspects are critical to maintain a high level of well-being, even if the financial aspects are uh, taken care of. They all, it all needs to be considered jointly. Now, why is this an important topic to talk about? Uh, and it does kind of feel like we're rambling a bit because there's a lot there's a lot to talk about here. Um, and it's 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 somewhat outside of our usual discussions about risk and expected returns. Um, but you think about what 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 good is is expertise, whether that's expertise with a third party, like like what PWL does, or if it's a person trying to take ownership of the household finances. Um, basically what we've been talking about 
through this segment is base rates. Like what, what are the things that increase well-being? Um, so you think about what are experts good for more generally? It's that. It's knowing base rates. They can't predict the future, but they understand base rates. So I think incorporating well-being evidence, broadly speaking, into financial decisions is is extremely um, extremely important. And and I'm not I'm not alone here saying this. Uh, the, the the Looney Doctor who was on this podcast in episode seventy three, he has realized this and built himself a holistic wealth framework, uh, which he discussed in the episode, and he has a post on his website as well. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm realizing more and more that this, the, all of these other aspects and, and making sure that they're informing financial decisions and making sure that the impact of financial decisions on these other aspects of well being are, um, taken into account is, is, uh, more, more important, or at least as important as, you know, the, the optimal factor tilt, um, or whether you should have a concentrated portfolio <laughs> or, a, or or an aggressive portfolio. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of impact on well-being, and again, I guess that's that's what it comes down to is that concept of, of well-being. If the goal changes from optimizing financial health or financial well-being, which is that concept of more, how do we get more? Um, just switching the framing to maximizing for well-being broadly speaking has the potential to materially change a lot of the decisions that people would make important decisions like big life-altering decisions yep i agree so i think talking about you know how much you need to save for retirement without talking about why do you want to retire or what what would you rather be doing i think it might completely miss the mark so you're ready to try our new feature. Yep. So you're pulling the card. I will pull a card. I'll let you pick right hand or left hand for those on right hand. All right. Imagine that you have a factory that can make anything. What would you make and why? Oh, <laughs> geez. We kick it off with an easy one. Oh my gosh. That is a brutally difficult question to answer. I mean, it can't be money or any financial resources because you just devalue them. What could the world use an infinite amount That's of? I'm thinking of. You do you want to be the good person? Do you want to make something that interests you? Yeah, but what would the good person make? Exactly. That's what I'm trying to, I know I'd love to make like it. I'd love to own a guitar factory and to be super cool, but that doesn't necessarily improve humanity. I'm imagining infinite production. You're going to infinitely produce guitars and the world's just going to be full, full of guitars. Full of guitars. <laughs> no, they'd be high quality, limited run guitars. Like fresh water or something? Or, you know, nets. Like what does the world need? Yeah, mosquito, mosquito nets. Mosquito nets, protection, carbon sequestration, machinery. Right, let's, do, let's, let's do one more. This one is too okay. weird. Yeah, carbon sequestration could be. You, 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 could, you could infinitely print carbon credits. All right. What is something that is priceless to you? Oh, geez. These are hard. What did we get ourselves into? <laughs> I mean, my, my family, um, for sure. Uh, my mind probably. Well, I mean like absolutely. Um, but the tricky thing about the mind is that if it goes, you probably won't even realize it. Although I do think like my grandmother has, Alzheimer's and one of the worst parts is when, when, although I think she's past this now, she doesn't come out of it so much, but when it was less advanced, she would come out of it and be able to recognize how far she'd gone. That was pretty, 